Stanford University. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Stanford Seminar on People, Computers, and Design. Next week, we have Jesse James Garrett from Adaptive Path, who's going to be speaking about his research on web design. Today, we're really fortunate to have all the way from, uh, from Illinois, Carrie Karahelios. And Carrie's been doing research for several years on social media and social spaces. She directs a research group in the computer science department at Illinois there on that topic. And for any of you thinking about going to graduate school, Carrie didn't ask me to say this, but uh, it's a wonderful place to go. I was out there back in March, and there's a lot of really exciting research going on there. And today, Carrie's going to talk with us about visualizing voice. OK. Um, so I guess my talk is going to be more of a story about why voice is so important and how I came to that conclusion, and then what we did once we realized that voice was so important. So um, I'm going to keep this pretty informal. If you have any questions, just don't hesitate to interrupt me. So um, I'm just going to start. Um, so one of my biggest inspirations, or one of the people who were my biggest inspirations um, in doing this work was William H. White. Um, he did about 16 years of studies in cities trying to find out what made public spaces useful. Um, and in many ways, a lot of my work deals with finding out how to bring social cues into public um, mediated spaces, whether they be physical or virtual. So it seemed logical to look at his work. Um, what he did is he put time-lapse cameras in a bunch of public spaces and tried to figure out why people used them or why they didn't. He had some theories that, you know, light would be good, trees are good. Um, it turned out the number one thing, the number one thing you need in a space to make it usable is somewhere to sit. And although this does not sound very groundbreaking, it's amazing as if how many places are designed that don't take into this account. Um, the Media Lab Atrium was one of my favorite examples. It made beautiful photographs. Um, you had these arc benches and concrete. Um, they were stunning, but they were very difficult to sit on. Um, but what does it mean to have a seat in a virtual space? Like, wh what do you do with that? So a lot of the work that I look at comes at it from a sociological perspective. We do a lot of ethnography in my group um, in terms of figuring out what makes a really successful mediated space. Um, and I use the term social catalyst as something that brings people together. And this is derived actually from something that William White called triangulation. So triangulation is a process by which some external stimulus provides a linkage between people and prompts strangers to talk to each other as if they were not. So here on the left, you see two people playing chess in Harvard Square. Um, and there's people just on the side that start talking to each other based on the game, even though they might not have known each other before. In the center, there's a piece of kinematic art in the Kendall Square um, tea stop. And actually, for the first time, you start thinking about the people at the other side, if both of you are trying to ring this, um, and would you have to collaborate to actually get something to chime or not, or who would win? And on the right is a little cat who was probably one of the best social catalysts and what my interfaces strive to be. Um, he lived in the media lab for a while, and it was funny. I think I met more people through him asking me if it was a dog or a mouse. Or, um, but in many ways, something like that just happening through your space really uh, makes people come together. But what can we do to interfaces to make that happen? And I've been studying this in museums. I've been studying it in public spaces. I first started studying it, though, in online spaces. So when I first began researching, I was looking at um, IRC, um, I was using um, different tools to look at Usenet. Um, early on, it was like TIN. Um, here, there's a snapshot of Usenet with Netscape. There's Zephyr. There's ICQ. Um, actually, this is one of my favorites. This is called um, Avatera. It used to be called Worlds Away. Um, and it was designed in 1984 for the Commodore 64. And at the time, you know, it was black and white. Um, the characters were smaller and, in my opinion, cuter. Um, one of the things that I think is fascinating about this piece, it was one of the first online systems to have an economy of tokens, where you would get tokens for how long you were online, and you can use these to buy furniture or to trade, and so on. We talk about Linden dollars today, but this is like the first time that you know, it started playing a huge role in a um, virtual community. Today, it still exists in this new format of Avatera, um, with some of the critical mass from the um, early 1984 version. Um, and this is an interesting interface. It's 2.5D, very, very easy to use. Um, 
in the mid-90s, mid to late 90s, people started making more three-dimensional systems like this one. Um, so far, all the systems that I've mentioning really have no audio component. These are all text-based. Um, here, they tried a little bit with audio. Um, the problem with the three dimensions here was that it was so hard to move the characters that once you designed your apartment or your loft and dressed up your character, you pretty much sat them on a couch and never, ever moved them again. So it didn't make for the most sociable of spaces with people not really moving. Um, looking in spaces like this, um, it became more and more frustrating to try to create a sociable, lively environment um, when you're sitting in a position like this all the time in front of a computer. So my interface has evolved more from that to looking more like this. Um, to actually encompass some of your physical space as well as the virtual space. So, I mean, we have thousands of years of experience navigating in our um, physical environment. There's several affordances that we're just used to having. Why not combine the two as opposed to separate the two? And one of the reasons I named my group Social Spaces as opposed to Social Computing was because if we do this right, then you don't notice that there's a computer there. So um, I'm going to talk about very few of these projects, uh, a few of these projects, but also it was this set of projects that actually led me um, to work on sound. So the goal of most of my projects is um, to create the design of augmented spaces for people. And I know that for people sounds obvious or redundant, but I can't stress this enough how often people design as if they're not designing for anybody else but themselves or sometimes even for no one. So there's a general, um, almost like a pseudocode that we do to do this. Um, number one, we explore which social cues to transmit between mediated spaces. And my passion is communication. So we look at a lot of the linguistics literature. We look at a lot of rapport theory. Um, we also look at a lot of sociology, like uh, Goffman's um, presentation of self in everyday life and Edward T. Hall. Um, then we sense the cues. So we have to do building of hardware to actually figure out what it is we want to use. And for audio, you know, our number one favorite tool is the microphone. Um, then we go on to the visualization stage. How do we visualize this to actually get the desired effect and then how to combine this with our physical environment to actually make a meaningful artifact that actually is married to the space in a harmonious way. Um, of one of the things that we do since we focus on conversation is, and I was inspired by um, the paper Beyond Being There by Helen and Stornetta. Um, and in this they talk about some of the cues that you need not just for um, but for face-to-face -face interaction as well as media interaction. And some of these are cue variety, feedback, message personalization, simultaneously being reminded of a need to talk to someone. You know, one of my biggest problems with um, teleconferencing systems is that sometimes you don't hear anything and you don't even know if there's somebody at the other end. Having a communication channel and turn-taking repair and stylized opening. And turn-taking, um, you're going to see a lot of in some of the later projects. Repair is something that we don't think about so much, but we do all the time. Like, for example, as I'm talking here, if Scott like, gave me this look of disgust, I might change what I'm saying slightly um, to try to convey what I think he doesn't understand. Um, meanwhile, if he's nodding up and down, then I might just keep going. Um, when we write email, it's really hard to do repair because you write a whole message, sometimes a manifesto, and you send it out. Um, and you might offend someone without even realizing it. With chat or with talk, you get a lot more turn-taking cues that you would get that you wouldn't get with email. But with email, you get other advantages. So I'm not saying one is better than the other. But these are the little things we have to look at when we communicate. And we take communication into a mediated environment when we're so used to speaking face to face. Um, so I'm going to start sort of like it, this story that I'm going to tell by looking at an earlier project that I did called Telemurals. And Telemurals was um, a project I was contacted by the university and they had a public art fund and what they wanted to do is they wanted to connect two dormitories on campus using an audio video connection. One was the oldest dormitory on campus, one was the newest dormitory on campus and they felt that they were too far away um, and they wanted to bring more of a sense of connectedness and feeling of being on campus. So they asked me to do a simple audio video connection between the two spaces. Um, not the first time this has been done. One of my favorite um, Examples of this is Hole in Space, done by Kit Galloway and Cheryl Rabinowitz in 1980. What they did is they connected a street corner in New York, in Lincoln Center, to a street corner in um, Century City in Los Angeles. And this ran for three days, for two hours a night. How many of you are familiar with this piece? Um, it's considered one of the seminal uh, pieces of telecommunication art. What was interesting about it, there was no signage. Um, they, they didn't use the internet either. They actually got a um, satellite company to help them um, send the video across. So the video quality was quite good for 1980, better than um, what we might have in some um, sort of like Skype scenarios today. Um, they had it on for three nights. 
And um, the first night, you know, people would walk on by. It was life scale. Um, they would look at it, kind of wonder what's going on. If you're interested, I have some of the original footage. Um, but some of the comments are like, you know, how did they get those people in there? What's going on? Um, by the second and third nights, people were arranging meetings with people on the other coast um, with people they hadn't seen in 20 years. There were sing-alongs. There were people trying to do dancing together. We sent the researchers to go on and to create new projects that dealt with sort of poetry readings across five different cities and dance competitions. One of the things that struck me about this piece was, um, as amazing as it was, and I, I haven't seen, I didn't see it in 1980. I saw video of it later. Um, was that attempts to reconstruct this today have just not met expectations. Um, some of this might be due to the fact that, you know, this was much more novel in 1980. It could have novelty effect. Um, we're also more familiar today with things like NetMeeting and Skype and iChat. Um, it might not be as surprising to us or as interesting. Um, and plus, we also don't get this scale all the time. There's something fascinating about the body and the scale of this type of work that I'm going to talk also about a bit later. An example of a more recent piece that did not meet expectations is the virtual kitchen done at Microsoft in 2001. Um, and um, actually, at the time, that's um, Scott Counts over there. He was an intern at the time. But um, they had some of the best engineers. Um, and again, this was using the internet. Um, but their goal here was that since MSR was getting so big, they were separating into several spaces. And they wanted to, um, again, keep people more cohesive. Um, and they thought that the kitchens were a very sociable space. People always talked there. They gossiped. They're like, let's connect three kitchens together. So what you see is um, upper left, um, Scott can see himself. That's the kitchen he's in. The kitchen on the right um, is kitchen number two. Bottom left is the third kitchen. And then on the bottom right is what I would call like their social catalyst. It was a stream of media, whether it be from cable or television, um, that if you didn't have anything to talk about, it might give you an idea of something to talk about. The first thing that happened was that um, people closed the audio of it right away. They felt it was like noise pollution. So it ended up, I think, on CNN with closed captioning. Um, the next thing that happened was people really wanted a button, a big red button, so they could press it to stop the connection every time they walked into the room if they didn't want to be um, seen. People started putting uh, napkins over the cameras. Um, in a sense, it made a space that was supposed to be social, um, antisocial. Um, and what I love about this paper is that they actually go in and describe why it didn't work. So few people actually go and do that. Um, and the number one reason was privacy. People just didn't really... Um, well, not people. I think they got it. But in terms of doing this design in the kitchen, people don't want to appear too social in the working environment. You might seem like a slacker. Maybe that's not the right place to do it. Also, there's this lack of reciprocity. For example, I might see what you're doing in a space even though I'm out of the field of view of the one camera. And you don't want to be seen that way to the whole world. It's easier when you know who's looking at you in that manner. So although this was supposed to be a long-term project, it didn't last more than, I think, two weeks or so. Um, but I think there was a lot learned from it. Number one, if you need a sign, if you need that much signage on the bottom, then something might be wrong with the interface about how to use something like this. Two, there were elements of play that people seemed to really like. Um, they would do little plays, like with little action figures with the cameras. Um, I was told, actually, when I was there, that somebody made a model of the men's bathroom and tried to point it, making it seem as if maybe it was looking into the bathroom as opposed to the actual kitchen. But one of the things that I want to stress with this is, I mean, this is some of the best engineering that could be done, and yet it did not work. And that's because the space wasn't looked at, and the social constraints weren't looked at. Also, if you're going to have audio and interface, make sure you have audio in a way that's usable. So you have people talking, but do you, if you want people to speak, do you really want to have a loud CNN channel also going on in the background while they're trying to communicate? Um, so I went back to the drawing board. I actually recreated Microsoft's thing. So when I first went to um, telemurals, I just put, uh, well, first we observed the space with nobody in there. It turns out these spaces, um, in the, the space in the new dorm was designed to be a gathering space. Nobody gathered there. Number one, there were no seats. Um, we were not allowed to put seats in due to fire code. Um, so we had to find some way to get people there without having chairs. So having the live video and audio connection, um, I managed to recreate Microsoft's effect in, in that people coming into that space would actually go out of their way to move out of the space as opposed to go anywhere near it. Um, so doing some reading, um, I decided to look more at non realistic rendering. Um, and so what you're seeing here on your left is an image from Scott McCloud's book, Understanding Comics, which I highly recommend if you have not read it. Um, what he says here is, when we have an abstract image through cartooning, 
We're not so much eliminating details as we are focusing on specific details. By stripping down an image to its essential meaning, an artist can amplify that meaning in a way that realistic art can't. So in many ways, one of the things that kids really like about cartoons is when something isn't fully explained, you project yourself into that cartoon, and it makes it easy for you to relate to it. Also, by not having somebody focus on everything, you can have them focus on just the parts that you want them to focus on. So we knew from the Microsoft experiment that privacy was a really, really big issue. I was also inspired by the movie Waking Life. To be honest, I wasn't the biggest fan of the movie, but I really liked the, the design. Um, so in this case, you know, if someone gets really excited, their hair might pop up, their eyes might bulge out of their head. So why is it that we're always trying to mimic face-to-face -face interaction and communication using a medium that can do other things? Um, so one of, I wanted to see what we can do with the environment and manipulate it to make it useful as opposed to having us always compare it to face-to-face -to -face interaction. So first thing we did, um, I sat down, this is a quick and dirty algorithm just for um, edge detection. So the way it works with the dormitories is this ran for over six months. We did two-week design iterations where we did a design, we had the students live with it for two weeks in their space, um, evaluated it, we made changes and did it again. This is the first one that actually made, that drew students into the space. Um, here, this is two people at two ends, just simple edge detection. Um, people were drawn to it. Um, they flocked for the first time ever. But after the two weeks, they're like, you know what, Carrie, we like it. But, you know, we like seeing other people at the other end, but we really want to see how we look like at the other end as well. Um, and it kind of makes sense. If any of you have ever had a caricature made of yourself, you're sort of like waiting in agony, waiting to see how you're represented by the artist. So the typical way that most people represent this is picture in picture. Um, we did not want to do that. We felt that it, it emphasized the separateness or the remoteness of the spaces as opposed to bringing them together. Um, and in many ways, you know, artists knew this way, way, way before we did. I mean, a lot of the theory behind framing a picture is meant to make it look somewhere very far away. Um, so the two things that we did to make it seem closer are one, blending the two people together in the same shared space, and two, eliminating the frame. So it looked something like this. So you have these two spaces here. Um, you see yourself as a yellow silhouette. You see the person at the remote end as a red silhouette. To take advantage of the privacy, or not to take advantage of the privacy, but to address the privacy issue, what we did is that when you first showed up into the space, um, you really were just a silhouette. But the more you moved and the more you spoke, the more it filled in. So you started looking a little bit more like the cartoon um, that you see here. Um, and in that way, you know, by, by moving around that space, you have some control. It's also very difficult to stand perfectly still, like if you want to watch someone and not be watched, because whether your eyes are blinking, we're just, we're just not capable of doing that. So you'll see a subtle silhouette even if someone's trying really hard to stay still. Even if they're sleeping, we found out. Um, so one of the things that um, I want to note here is that so far, the audio is just straight back and forth audio. Not that much has changed. Um, actually, in the six months that this ran in the dormitory, we only had one privacy complaint, just one, and it was over the audio. One conversation was overheard in one dormitory um, that just by chance was heard in the other, was spoken in the other, that um, caused a strife. But just to give you some idea of what this looked like, um, let's see if this works. So somewhere, the audio isn't as important here, but... Um, so just to see in a space, um, this is actually a wedding. There was a wedding in a dormitory for some reason. Um, so it turned out actually having events made it much more useful and intriguing. Kids tended to like it more than adults in the settings. And um, we did not ask these people to, to pose for us. But one of the other goals that we had here was... Um, in terms of you know, the William White coat, what attracts people most is other people, is we wanted an interface that worked even if nobody was at the other end. So if you walked up to that space and you did something and you moved around, it was still interesting. We saw some gender differences in that men tend to fix their hair a lot more, um, a lot of boxing maneuvers. Um, we didn't ask these people to do this. We had a camera. Sometimes maybe if you see a camera, you might do something silly. Um, but it was... Um, the idea was that, and by having one person in one space, you attracted a person at the other space. So we wanted something that worked alone, but also worked as a team. Um, we had hundreds and hundreds of hours that we had to annotate of this video to come up with different gestures. And um, due to lack of time, I'm not going to show the whole video, but one of the things I want to stress here is that people are moving, but nobody's talking. 
Nobody's talking, even though there's an audio channel. People are just not using it. Um, so go back to some of the maneuvers. We coded, actually, um, about 50 different behaviors. This is one of the most common ones, and, and we call this one the comeback here. This person's coming in from the outside of one of the dormitories holding a shopping bag. He saw himself, kind of came back. He's making some type of peace sign. And then for some reason, um, goes back the way he came. So it makes you wonder why he like, <laughs> went that way in the first place. But this was the most common thing we got between the hours of like 1 and 5 in the morning. And so obviously there were differences in times. Um, when we first started this project, it was just running one night a week for an hour. Um, we got the biggest audience at that time. Um, it was more like an event, like a television show. Then more and more people asked to have it um, longer, so it became two nights a week, then two hours every single night, and then finally 24-7. Um, when it was 24-7, it, it did not get the type of use that it got when it was on for limited amounts of time, as if you were like tuning in for, um, tuning in for like a television show or something. But one of the things that I learned from this is that people were not speaking. They were just moving, so it didn't make for much of an interesting interaction. So the next thing we did is we decided to encourage people to talk, so we put up a sign that said, you can talk here. This is a microphone. That did absolutely nothing. Still nobody spoke. The next thing we did is as people smoke, we took their words, put them through um, speech to text recognition, and plastered them like graffiti on the screen. And even though it wasn't 100% perfect, uh, by doing that, we got five times more usage of the space um, overall just by having that audio feedback. Um, uh, originally, it was actually trained on the Wall Street Journal, so it wasn't very good. Um, nobody speaks in perfect sentences. Um, nobody really talks about the Dow Jones that often in a social setting in a dormitory. We then trained it on some episodes of Friends, and it got much, much better. Still not perfect, but um, much, much better. And it turned out that was the number one factor in terms of, from what it was before, in increasing participation. I'm sorry. Yes? Uh, you know, someone that people know, uh, to whom they are talking, yeah. a friend or something? That's, a, that's actually a very, very good point. Um, in terms of some of the studies that we did looking at teleconferencing, um, there's a really good paper by Isaacs and Tang about what video can and cannot do for you. So it turns out when you have a video conversation, um, there's two things you can get out of it. Um, one, you can get someone's attention level, like if they're interested or bored, or like if they're doing their nails while they're talking to you. And you can get some level of... Um, if they're anxious, if they're um, just some other sort of personality style. So it turns out that if you know someone, you know their gait, you know how they move, people often recognize people that they knew with no problem. So, for example, like if I saw my brother across the screen, I would know exactly who he was because I know how he walks, I know how he talks. Um, and so that recognition did happen. People also scheduled meetings. They're like, let's meet by the telemural and talk there. However, if you asked me to design an interface for personal communication, this would not be what I would use. If I had to work with somebody to design a project or to work on a part of an engine, I would do something totally different than I would do here. And this is really meant sort of going back to the social catalyst of having people who did not know each other actually come together and maybe start an interaction when they otherwise would not have. But yeah, that was interesting with the video is that people looked at mostly the posture, like were you bored and if you were paying attention to them, those two things. Um, this is an earlier example of some of the early fading that we did. Um, when, like I said, we had two-week iterations. Um, when we had this one, the students felt really disconcerted. They didn't like the floating heads going across these weird bodies. This one would go from um, more silhouette-like, actually there were more full silhouettes at this time, to black and white photorealistic. Um, and then we eventually settled on this, where you have more of a silhouette, which you can barely see to the left, and slowly move to what you see on the right. Um, so um, that was sort of like my first experience in seeing like how that little sort of representation of audio made people use audio a lot more. By using the audio, they did cut down on their gestures. However, that makes sense when you have two modes of interaction. Um, but overall, interaction increased. Um, Chit Chat Club was a piece I did shortly after that. I had read this really um, amazing paper by Scherer about affect and voice. And part of me wanted to see what you can do if you bring computing into a cafe environment. Um, at the time, I was traveling across Europe, and I would kept looking for internet cafes just to check my email. But many of the things that I found was that, you know, by putting a computer into the space, it was making the space 
almost less social. You can almost see an invisible wall between the people actually on the computers and the people socializing or drinking coffee. So how could I make a space where I bring a computer um, and actually make people interact a bit more? So this is the vision. Um, the idea is you go into a space with a friend or alone, you sit down and you talk to somebody else through one of these sort of um, telesculptures. Somebody from far away can actually um, log in um, and in a sense possess one of these, um, one of these entities. Um, I think it was probably also inspired a bit by having watched Bing John Malkovich at the time. Um, one of the things I want to note early on is that there is an asymmetry here. You know, one space is much more social, the other space is a bit more solitary. So, you know, the idea is that maybe if I'm in Rio, I might see what it's like to be in a space in Manhattan or New York. Um, so, this is the very first instantiation of the Chit Chat Club. On the left um, is our first chair, his name is Slim. Um, there's a projector there that projects the face onto a head that's actually made of foam and bondo. Um, and there's a little camera on the, on the res resting here on the wrists. Um, the design here was actually a bit of a challenge. We wanted the sculpture to look um, humanoid, but not so anthropomorphic that you would expect human behavior from it. Um, and we wanted you more to focus on the face than to focus on the rest of the body, but also we wanted the scale to fit at the table itself. And this is um, me and Kelly Dobson sitting around um, our first um, slim, the very first time we put him up. Um, this is a close-up of the face, just so you can see a little bit better. Um, there were three different styles of faces. There was a hand-drawn face, there was a cartoon-like face, and claymation face. And um, if any of you are thinking about doing claymation, just so you know, it takes a really, really, really long time. Um, the way the interface worked was um, you had a video channel, and then you had different expressions, and you can choose this express these expressions to animate onto the face. So you had happy. Um, this expression here was bored, so if you didn't talk to the chair for a while, it would like turn left and right and start whistling. Um, sometimes it would say, say something. Um, this is like more of a duh like expression. This was sad and that was angry. Um, the way you started at the remote end for this interface was um, logged into the system. Um, the blue chairs are physical people chairs, so we could tell who was sitting in a chair with a pressure sensor. The red is the avatar chair, so you can see if one was open. If it was, you click on it, you enter the space. Um, and kind of like the way you might dress up before you got to a cafe or a club, you got to choose your face, in this case, almost Mr. Potato Head style. So you got to choose your eyes, your mouth, sort of the background, whether or not you wanted sunglasses or others, other accessories. And then you were brought into the space here, and you could see the people at the other end, and then you had your five expressions that I showed you earlier to choose from. Um, so this interface turned out to be a complete failure. Um, one of the reasons for this, um, after, doing many, um, after studying this for some time, was that, again, going back to Holland's Tornetta, people need to be reminded of the need to talk, something to remind you that there is a connection there going on. Once you clicked on one of these faces over here, it would animate to that face and then go back to baseline. So as soon as the face stopped moving, the people at the table thought that the connection was gone. Um, also, the people at the remote end kept clicking on the faces all the time to keep the connection going rather than talking. So there really isn't that much of an interaction going if you're just clicking on one end and people are like, oh, they're still there, they're still there. So we went back to the drawing board. We designed three new chairs focusing on different aspects, um, ended up building this one, um, and then later a version of that one here. So this is this, um, oh, that's just us building the second chair. Um, this is the second chair, and this one is Orlando. Um, I'm going to confess, this is a doctored image. It looks kind of ghostly and freaky. Um, it's really hard to take a picture of a projection and a physical object at the same time. So we took them separately and plastered them onto each other, and the result is ghostly. Um, but this is Orlando. Um, he's made out of plywood, or he slash she is made out of plywood. Um, there's also a projector here. Um, the intensity of this projector actually was much stronger, and that turned out to be a distraction. This is a case where we actually wanted to tone down the, the luminance of a projector. The other one was softer and was for more made for a more comforting experience. There's also a motor in the belly of Orlando, so that this time the users could actually choose who they want to look at from the remote end um, versus in the previous chair with Slim, you had to ask, can you please move me to face so-and-so or can you move me to face so-and-so. This new interface, um, the first thing that happened once you started it up is a chair would move from left to right, pan and make a panorama. So you had a feel of what the space looked around you um, instead of just where you were looking at at that time. So you, just, you have some sense of aura or ambience of the space. Down here, we have what's called uh, an expression wheel. And unlike the previous version where it was very explicit what the expressions were, this one we wanted to be more exploratory so that you didn't feel like you always had to choose a label or be what you wanted to feel like. Um, 
but you could explore it. We played a lot with colors, so the, the happier colors tended to be more of the happier faces. Um, but the other thing that we did, the biggest factor, was in taking your voice and changing the expressions based on your voice. Um, the user could always override what our system claimed to say, um, but it turns out by doing this and visualizing the voice um, um, made people actually talk more and use the interface um, for over an hour, whereas before it was only up to five, ten minutes. Um, just to show you a very quick movie of this. Maybe. Okay, okay. so this is our user so logging in. Let me choose a chair. Also, you can see yourself. That became a common theme in like wanting to actually see oh. what you look like at the other end. Hello. Hello there. Hey, black guys. What's up? Yeah, so the motion of this also made it feel more like a presence in the space as opposed to not. You know, two things I want you to notice about this. One, um, the sculpture is way above the heads of the people in that space. This turned out not to be the best of the designs. It's really much better to have you being eye to eye. Um, so we ended up actually moving this to more um, cocktail style table later on because that made a huge difference in how often people spoke. So well, another thing. I will offer you some gummy bears well, first. I'll let it go. And we can put some surface. So something else I want you to notice is that the eyes aren't blinking. This was very disconcerting. Um, by making the eyes blink, people talked from like 20 minutes to like half an hour to 45 minutes. Um, even having them blink randomly did that alone. Um, it was very frustrating to have the eyes just just static in that space. So in terms of the faces, people actually preferred the faces from Slim because they were more extreme, they were more exaggerated. Because um, we did this automatically, we didn't, if we were wrong, we didn't want to, we didn't want to, you know, overemphasize something that might be wrong, but you could actually extrapolate it from yourself. So one of the things that we found was that people actually preferred the form and faces of Slim, the first chair that we showed you, but preferred the interface of the second chair of Orlando, um, which actually visualized the voice on its own. Um, a later version of this chair that was shown actually in the San, um, in the San Jose Museum of Art um, is this version here. This one was called Ginger, and this one was far more abstract. Um, this was up for seven days, running 24-7, um, and we had thousands of people actually logging into it, so much so that we had to actually build a waiting room into the interface. So we actually had to build an online queue where people waited and actually chatted while they waited to actually get into the... Um, get into the space. And one of the things that we found was that that actually became an interesting project in itself because they would come up with schemes to swap spaces in line and, um, um, and get in there. Also, um, in this version of the interface, we looked at a lot of pitch. So what you see here, these lines emanating from there are projected onto that chair. Um, and in some ways, people thought of them as vocal cords. Now you've got bigger circles as you spoke louder, smaller circles as you spoke, slow, as spoke softer, um, but people also could drag in different images and they would blend in to a more abstract rendering of you know, who you were at the other end. Um, and again, in many ways, you know, this was also inspired by Bill Buxton's Hydra piece. Um, and looking at this, I never got the pleasure of actually experiencing this, but one of the things I wanted to stress with Chit Chat Club is the physicality of having something sort of at your height, at your level. Um, because we noticed that when it was much, much taller than you, it felt really uncomfortable actually looking up to something that big and bulky. Um, also, we made Orlando to be out of wood to be warmer, to be more pleasant, because we thought that maybe the metal in, in Slim would make it more cold, and it turned out not to be the case. Um, it wasn't probably the wood, it was just so bulky. A lot of people um, said that Orlando looked a bit like E.T. and a bit more alien-like um, in its design. Um, so, so the last intro piece I'm going to talk about is Visiphone. And some of you may have seen this before. Um, the idea here is quite simple. The easiest way to think of Visiphone is as a graphical interface to a teleconferencing system. Basically, you have two spaces. People are talking, and you see something. 
you see a representation of the visual of the conversation at each end. So um, one way to yeah, I guess that's one of the easiest ways to think about it. So you have person in the remote space, let's say far away, and the person in the local space that's closer to you. And one of the things that inspired this too was having so many teleconferences when I was working at IBM. Um, you know, you're sitting there talking into this big black box and you keep looking at it even though it provides no additional information. And I think part of that reason is we just don't like speaking to a disembodied voice. It's very awkward. We associate it with an object. Another thing that was frustrating with, um, um, with teleconferencing was that you'd scream really, really loud because you wouldn't know if your voice was getting across, sometimes deafening the person at the other end. So we wanted to see what we can do with an interface. What type of aesthetic interface also would you put in your home that meant something to you? Um, so the design was very, very simple. Local space is orange, remote space is blue. Uh, we just took a power amplitude. Um, we can think of it actually as a simple way to think about it, although not exactly, just the average of the volume at a time interval, mapping it to a circle. So if the volume is loud, uh, you have a bigger circle, more saturated color. If the volume is soft, smaller circle, less saturated color. Um, so you have that for the remote space, which is blue, and the local space, which is orange. And just the way you know, our conversation blends when we speak together, we blend the graphics as well here. Um, but we blended in HSV space, so almost like blending colors, not so much just pasting the orange onto this, to, make, to really give you sort of like, is this a colorful conversation or not? So in a sense, what we have here is we have a picture of a conversation you know, in, this, um, in this rendering. And we took this and we projected it onto a dome, um, with T equals now being at the very top and falling down to the bottom. And um, this took some machining. Um, we took some plastic and we thermoformed it to make a dome. And once you get the alignment just right, you really get this illusion that you have a curved digital screen. In fact, we had people like slamming on it and just trying to figure out like, where the pixels were. Um, and it actually it looked something like this. Um, the idea here is to show patterns in conversation that you might not um, otherwise notice. So for example, I, I stressed turn taking earlier on when I first started. A typical conversation has turn taking where you might have orange dots, then blue dots, then orange dots, then blue dots. Um, if the entire dome was orange, then that person might be dominating the conversation. If the entire dome was blue, then the remote space was dominating the conversation. Um, you know, one of the funniest things is I was having once an argument with my mom is that I told her she wouldn't let me speak and she said, no, I do let you speak. And so we just hooked this up. And um, it became totally blue. And she's like, well, I normally let you speak, but just not this time. Um, so in many ways, it shows you things that you know, but don't realize that you know. And it makes them explicit to people, to all the people involved, not just you. So you sort of get this, this becomes like this third person like mirror, almost like a social mirror into the space. One question I often get is, why is it more beautiful when people are arguing? Like, why do you get all this rich tone of violets and um, um, some people claim that it encouraged them to interrupt other people just to get those colors that they wanted. You know, and that, that is a good question. Um, you know, arguments are more colorful. Um, we did want to be able to know, though, when you were having, you know, what's called like typical um, turn taking. So um, we had different forms of this. The smaller version on the left was actually one of my favorites. This, people use this for more intimate conversations, uh, like in a bedroom, and you could actually take this one, turn it back, and replay a conversation over time. So like I have a conversation with my dad that I stored, and it's, it's nice to actually be able to play it back. Um, this is the one we showed at SIGGRAPH. Um, this one also did not go over very well at all. The idea here was we wanted to have something here for a larger audience, that you didn't just have a few people in the round. Um, uh, the design just didn't make much sense for it. Why would you have a spiral on a flat angled space? The spiral made sense in the dome because you almost had like gravity pushing the dots down. It did not make as much sense here and people just never ever used this. Um, so one of the things we also learned about this is that it became a, a focal point. You didn't, you didn't need to use it to have the conversation. So it did not require 100% of your attention. But even with a short glance, you can get some sense of what the conversation is like. And sometimes people use it with the audio off almost as a presence detector just to see if somebody, if there was life in another room. Um, we had like thousands of people using this um, in a lab setting and at, um, and at several venues. Unfortunately, we never really got to test this um, formally. Um, during SIGGRAPH, I was approached by um, a couples counselor who was like, you know, I would really like to use this, you know, in some of my sessions with people. And I laughed it off at first. I was like, you know, whatever. That's not what it was designed for. Um, but I was so glad that I met him because that started sort of like a new line of research for us. Like all this time, I was focusing on connecting remote spaces with audio and mediating that. But why not also mediate face-to-face -face interaction? What can you get out of that that you cannot get out of, um, 
Um, what, what can you do with mediation in that sense that you would not get just from face-to-face -face interaction? Um, we also had some handheld versions. Um, this one actually right now, it used to run on an IKEA um, communicator. Um, we're trying to get it to run on an iPhone. Um, the idea here is that it's group conversation. What <coughs> happens if you had your phone on 24-7? Um, and in a sense, ideally it was supposed to be a t-shirt, like you could wear your social network on you at all times. And the little centipedes actually would move around. And if you were talking to somebody, you would cluster together. Um, unfortunately, it would show people left out kind of in a corner. Um, but the idea was that it would show sort of like your everyday interactions. Um, you know, would some people have like 50 people on their t-shirt? Would some people have just two? And emphasize that um, it's a more rich interaction. We don't know yet. Um, but Visiphone really inspired uh, the next piece I'm going to talk about called Conversation Clock. And Conversation Clock um, is essentially a table. Um, the first version ran with four spaces. Um, and the idea is, is to mediate face-to-face co-located interaction. So the inspiration really wanted to explore group dynamics, because there's a lot going on between differences in conversation between two people versus three, four, five, and obviously um, further on. Um, we wanted to be co-located as well as a remote space. So you could use these tools remotely, but you could also use them in the same space. We wanted, the we wanted visualization of the whole group all the time. So in a sense, this is our social mirror. We also wanted to explore power hierarchy and interaction, show how visualization affects interaction. So um, very straightforward. Each color is a different person. They have microphones on them. Um, the length of the bar represents volume, and dots rep represent moments of silence. So you can start seeing here more of like what a typical conversation is like. People start speaking, and then you can see it ramping down. What you got out of this that you did not get out of Visiphone was some of the more subtle nuances of the audio as it tapered down to the ends. And here, this is, more, this is reminiscent of more typical turn-taking. Um, again, it was just projected from a table up above. Um, it would be nice to have some type of rear projection in the future, because we found that people were less likely to use their laptops during a meeting, which may be a good thing. I don't know, because they didn't want to occlude um, some of the space of the table. Originally, we had microphones embedded into the table. We took those out, because they made so much noise when people tapped or did anything. So we moved on to lapel microphones. But what did we discover about this? One, we knew we were looking at turn-taking, but we found other things that we didn't really realize as well. So you start to see pictures and understanding how people interrupt and what, what, interrupt, what these types of interruptions might mean. So people start looking at pictures and saying at a glance, oh, this was an acceptable interruption, so this was a rude interruption. So you can see what these look like. These are people sort of chiming in together here in the middle. These are people kind of like trying to fight for the floor here. On the top is what was more typical turn-taking. You can also see conversational dominance. So for example, I have to admit the blue here is me. This is one of our group meetings where I was talking more than the students were talking. And in a sense, I wasn't letting them get a word in. You could also see silence. It's hard to see those gray dots up there. But those are moments when nobody's speaking. And actually, the visualization emphasized the awkwardness of the silent moments, because you're just like tick, tock, tick, tock. Um, agreement and back channels. This was probably the key. This is one of the things that um, led many um, so sociologists to us. And they're actually using this now for annotation of their studies. Um, this idea of seeing agreement um, in conversation, just the aha, uh -huh, the yeah, the role playing was huge. And we didn't realize that this was going to be one of the big takeaways of this project, is finding out who are the followers in the conversation, and in some sense, who are the leaders, just by looking at these small little dots or places of overlap. We were also looking at mimicry. It turns out with rapport theory that if you want to show allegiance to somebody, you don't talk too much louder than them, you don't talk too much softer than them, but you actually find some way to, to mediate your audio and keep the, the high volumes the same. And we found that using the interface, you can see some, type, some sense of rhythm and flow. This was like a huge laughter, that huge spike over there. Um, and you can see differences in time spans to the point where we started using this as an archival tool. So the moments of laughter and the moments of interruption tended to be very salient in, in the meeting itself. And one of the things we want to see is, you know, is this as good as maybe doing you know, um, speech to text recognition and just searching through text? You know, we don't know yet. Um, but going back to the social mirror, I think one of the things that's key about this is that everybody sees the same, same things. And like the Visiphone, it reveals patterns that might not otherwise be seen. Or again, things that you know but don't realize that you might know. Um, also, self-reflection. Self um, I guess maybe with the maybe with the telemurals project too, and this one, by learning more about yourself the more you speak, somebody suggested that I'm actually building therapy tools or that maybe I should go to therapy. But um, again, you get this real-time feedback um, that you don't normally get. And 
you know, this may be, this may not be a good thing. Do you really want real-time feedback? Like, how would the presidential debates have gone if they knew it every single minute if audience reaction was positive or negative, and they tried to, like, do what, what the repair that I mentioned earlier? Yes? Doesn't this distract the people in the meeting from what they're actually discussing? That's an excellent question. I'm going to postpone that for a few slides when I address it there. Is that okay? So, um, and again, the history is, is key here. It's persistent, um, which is why you can see it at a glance. Um, again, you, you get the context of the conversation um, and an evocative artifact. One of the things that people often ask us for postcards if they could take home after the studies. Like one person was like, I wish I could have like the day I proposed to my girlfriend like as a picture so we could like just put it up in our living room and have it as an evocative artifact of, of the conversation. So we first started doing a pilot study in this. And we fir what we noticed is that the person speaking does not look at all of the visualization. The person that they're speaking to doesn't look at it either. The people that are not being addressed at that very moment, do look at it. Um, but also, when it's there, people do like it more than if it was not there. So I'm still not convinced it's not a complete distraction. I mean, whenever you have like, saturated colors staring at you, um, we're just, it's, it's wired in us. We're built in to see things that are changing, things in motion. But the people that were speaking and the people that were being spoken to did not look at it. Um, the, so the listeners, by contemplating the ones that they're not being spoken to are the ones that are um, probably glancing at it more. Um, we started with different topics. Um, so uh, food, movies, class projects, academic papers, music. Um, we eventually looked at different um, voting rights and um, we had each group agree on a different topic that they would discuss and they did this for a series of, um, of three long sessions. So we had the before the visualization, we had the uh, with the visualization, and we had the without the visualization again. And we also tried two different time spans. We tried um, doing it for 10 minutes versus trying it for half an hour, just to see if the length actually made a difference. So some of the things that we measured, uh, we measured turns, length of speech, leads, glances, gestures. We did surveys. We did interviews. Um, and some of the things that we found, um, the overall finding was um, we divided people into like people that spoke a lot and people that spoke a little. Um, it turns out that the people that spoke a lot um, still, still spoke a lot. They did stop speaking um, a bit more. It did balance the conversation more, but there was a slight um, bias towards the people who spoke a lot. There was more balance of conversation. However, um, in terms of their turns, what they did is they, they took the same number of turns, but they made them shorter. The people who spoke very little, little um, took many more turns. Um, so you can see it here. Um, this is with the visualization here, um, that's final, and this is, this is the shorter one, this is the bigger one, this is before, and this is after. Um, glances. We also looked at glances to the table because we were really concerned as to whether or not it would be totally distracting. Um, when the visualization was there, people did look at it. So right here, in these two, in the middle, that's when people looked at the visualization. Um, this is actually gesturing. Because we were also worried that people might not gesture over the projection because it was projected from the top. And it turns out that people did tend to not put as many things on the table or use their hands over the table for fear of destroying um, the projection. Um, some of the qualitative feedback that we got. Um, it's easy to judge who is driving the conversation. I was trying to look at the circle to see whether we were balanced. I realized that I could monitor my speech patterns by watching the colors. It was interesting to train myself not to say um as much or to pause. Um, I noticed that when you're the one talking, you want to stop, but you're mid-topic, you couldn't stop because you had to finish your topic. But as soon as you finished your topic, you'd shut up. Or it became all red, should yellow or green speak next? So, you know, I'm not arguing that this should be um, the way conversations are held, but one of the things that I find fascinating about this is that you can influence conversation through visualization. Like, if you want more balanced interaction, you can get it by having this visualization. In fact, once um, in doing... Uh, and this is, not, this is not a study. This is just sort of like practicing. Um, we made it so that the visualization was not um, exact. So if one person spoke, um, they got many more bars um, than it, what it would be for the other people. And that person actually spoke half, as le half the time because the, the balance was there. So I would love to do more studies in that area. So um, with more students, we'll hopefully be able to do that soon. Um, so summary. Uh, people found the visualization to be revealing of their interaction. Um, they glanced, not focused on it, but um, that's still a big concern, the glancing even. Um, above and below average participants reacted differently. So like I said, um, the difference was in the number of turns and the length of the turns. So for example, people that spoke less took more turns. People that spoke a lot just shortened the amount of turns that they took. 
Um, and the thing that shouldn't have surprised us was that people showed an extensive interest in themselves. Um, that's why we look at mirrors. Um, and we always want to see how we compare to other people in our, in our landscape. Um, but again, I think the biggest thing that we're getting from this from a sociologist, um, and we're starting work now with Northwestern to look at some of these issues even more, is looking at roles and interaction from a picture. Like looking at a picture, people are like, oh, this is a meeting. This is two people arguing. And they're like, this person is like, you know, um, yelling at this person here. And people would make up stories just looking at the pictures. Um, archival is an issue for privacy reasons. Um, people have to um, want their piece to be archived for it to be, um, for it to be saved. Um, and again, they can take it home with them and actually play it back almost like a, a little private record. So ongoing work in this, um, as a public display, what does it really convey to others? Um, how can they augment the mirror with their knowledge of the context? For example, for me, people wanted to actually add documents. And when we were talking about this, I want to refer to this, and they wanted to include a document there. Um, we want to develop it into an archival tool and see how good the search is. Will you really find things in a meaningful way using this versus not using this? Um, at Northwestern, we're working with Darren Grogel to study language discourse and pragmatics. And um, a huge bulk of our time right now is being spent encouraging turn-taking of children um, with autism spectrum on the autism spectrum disorder, and also with much lower functioning children, encouraging them to speak. It turns out that a lot of kids, if they don't say anything by the age of five, will probably not speak. And so we're focusing kids at the ages between two and five, using our tools to help them to, uh, to encourage them to speak. Um, a next iteration of this table actually evolved to, um, to allow for votes. So basically, I mean, Many of you may have been in a meeting like this when you're talking and somebody just keeps talking and talking but doesn't say anything that interesting and then one person might say one word but that word is a gem. Like how can you in a visualization sort of like give credit to that? So in a sense we sort of built like a stock market of the value of or priced your bits of audio. So you can vote. Um, people had two buttons under a table. Um, they could vote whether or not they wanted you to stop talking or to keep talking. And um, like many designs, you know, you, you never get it right the first time. This did not work. In fact, if you want to build an interface to make people angry, this is what you do. Um, so um, went back to the drawing board again. Um, and keep in mind, the number of people matters a lot. So it turns out that, well, I'll get to that a little later. Um, so the first thing we did is we got new buttons that didn't make a noise when you clicked. Um, that made it a lot better and less disconcerting. The second thing we did is we took out the negative button. So it's kind of like what your mom said, don't say anything unless you have something good to say. So we actually emphasized the good as opposed to punishing the bad. And there was this really good paper in Nature magazine a few weeks back called Winners Don't Punish. Um, it's nice and short, it's two pages, I recommend you look at it. Um, but it turns out it makes people want to use an interface so much more than this fear of like, oh my god, what if I get a negative vote? Um, so this is the, the new version of the table has just one button. You can hold it in your hand or you can put it um, underneath the table and actually tap it with your knee. Um, so other things we had to change. For example, let's say somebody had a positive and a negative vote at the same time. The size of the bar won't change. And since I haven't told you what that means, that doesn't make any sense. But um, essentially, everyone has the same size rectangular bar. If you get a positive vote, your bar gets longer. If you get a negative vote, your bar gets smaller um, as a signal for you to know if people, how people are reacting to your conversation. So in that sense, if you got a positive and a negative vote, the size would not change, so you would not know. So we put little dots on top to let you know um, how many votes you had, um, so you can know if it was like net positive or, or not. Um, also, if you see, this is mirrored here. So no matter where you're sitting, we try to give people a view of the space or a view of what's happening. So here is history. This is where the conversation started. We're going here towards now, and in the center is what's going on right now. Also, because as people vote, um, you know, we actually had to change the animation slightly to sort of back project, because if you vote now, it's probably for something that somebody started saying also a little bit a little while ago. So there's a, a, a nice little subtle animation going on while the, inter, while, the in, while the visualization is progressing. So some of the things that we found for this. I could get a visual grasp of argument, conversation, successes, winning others over. Um, that was big. I could check if others were agreeing uh, with the point present, presented, not necessarily by me. Um, changes in participation. In terms of the visualization and the balance, uh, we, got several, we got similar results that we had to um, the conversation clock. Um, the biggest change that we noticed, like the biggest finding that we saw in this work was that people who actually voted felt more involved in the conversation and liked it more and wanted to keep using it. So one of the other inspirations for this piece was actually um, work by Sarah Kiesler and Lise Bruhl, if 
I'm pronouncing that last name right, where they were looking at face-to-face -face meetings, and it turns out that people up in the hierarchy were speaking a lot more than people that were far lower in the work hierarchy, but over email, people were speaking up just as much. So what would happen if we could mediate, if we can get the people who didn't speak as much to, um, to communicate via this um, via this anonymous channel, and that's what we found, that even though some people didn't communicate, they voted a lot more. So um, we'll have sort of more detailed results uh, about this in about a week if you're interested, and I can email them out to you. Um, but it turns out that people want to feel represented, they want to feel like their vote makes a difference, and they want to see how it makes a difference. And it turns out once you see that, you actually like the interaction a lot more. And it reminded me of, I was talking to a graduate student, Heidi, I think today, and I'd like to talk to her about that too. Um, but again, it opened a back channel for all. Um, some people called it a social mirror karma, or called it karma. Um, you get what's coming to you. I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, it did provide for balanced conversations. And again, I don't think maybe all conversations should be balanced. Um, but again, this is a way to influence a conversation. Um, it provides an awareness of self and a different type of voting vocabulary. So going back to the number of people, it turns out that when you had five people or less, people wanted just one button. Um, because you could sort of guess, you're sitting there looking around the table, kind of like you're in Survivor, trying to see who you're going to like kick off the island if you guess who voted negatively for you. As soon as you start getting about 100 people, people wanted more resolution. They wanted to be able to say a bit more than just, you know, I like this or I don't like this. They wanted things like fact checking, like a parameter for facts, a parameter for I don't like what you said or I don't agree with what you said. But they wanted more resolution. And, you know, it's a big challenge to figure out design-wise how you incorporate this into, into something like this, or what are the features that you should use to do that. Um, so I still have some time. So I'm going to show you um, our latest table right now. And the idea, this one is called topic table. And basically, a lot of people were working in um, topic clustering. So basically, you know, you have a huge, huge corpora of text. People are clustering them into topics. But um, topic, well, speech recognition is not that good. On top of that, um, the clustering is not that good. So you're doing clustering on top of really bad speech recognition. How might we um, you know, use HCI to try to play with this a little bit? Conversation clusters imbues a casual so. social space with a historical account of verbal this? exchange. The table yeah. actively collects the words and topics of nearby interaction. Salient, descriptive, and significant words are chosen to offer ambiguous contextual cues to any passerby or later visitor. Hey, Art. Hey. How you doing? Good. Anything interesting this past weekend? Uh, no, not really. But I was just reading the Cafe Lunas movie. Did you hear that? No, why? Yeah, uh, they just want more business, I think. But they're in a great location. They're right in the middle of downtown. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I think it'll be good in this location, actually. I think the, they're, they're going to that, that place by the train tracks, you know, that new building? Or that old building? But then all the undergrads are not going to be able to get there. I'd imagine, yeah. considering, I mean, large state school, lots and lots of undergrads. Yeah, but, I mean, downtown does really well right now. I mean, for, for, like, the business people, those, I mean... I think that's Luna's clientele. I think that's who, who they make their money from. Really? No, I mean, during the day, I mean, I can understand that for, like, the nights and weekends, but during the, during the daylight hours? I don't know who they get the money well. from. <laughs> the daylight hours, I have no idea. I don't know, maybe they're not open. They're open for lunch, I think. But they I have to be open during the afternoon, too. Space around the table is monitored by dedicated microphones, each of which analyzed independently with speech recognition software. Topics are extracted using a temporal theme data mining algorithm to distinguish relevant current topics and monitor their change over time. So what's going on with you? Oh, not much. I mean, I just, just went uh, out of town this past weekend up to Chicago. Yeah. See your girlfriend? Yep. Yeah. It's just, it's nice to get away, you know. You don't get a lot of work done, but... Well, go ahead. Do you get your tickets for Florence? Uh, yeah, I think we uh, made that, like, last month. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be a good trip. Where are you staying at? It's called Corona. I, I think it's Le Hotel, two blocks from the convention center. It, it looked nice. I mean, one of the big things I really wanted was to have a mini fridge mm. in the hotel yeah, room yeah, so that I can get, yeah. like, bread or something like that yeah. and store it there. Yeah, that's a good idea. Last, when we were in France last couple of years ago, we ate out at the supermarkets or the, the markets, and that's so much cheaper than eating at a restaurant all the time. Especially with the conversion rate of the oh my God. dollar to oh the my euro. God. I'm going to have to eat the dollar. Probably <laughs> be cheaper. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to eat the dollar, 
and uh, individual words of interest and the resulting themes are projected into the conversational space with an overhead projector. As speech recognition and topic extraction are not perfect, individuals can choose to interact directly with the table. Words and topics can be moved or deleted. An improperly placed word may be added or removed from any topic. Diamond Touch tabletop technology is used to facilitate this interaction. While interacting with the table, one may change views and see the full evolutionary history of a conversation. The conversation cluster's visualization explores the boundaries of a private conversation in a public space. While audio conversation is not directly recorded, the evolution of conversational themes is made available to anyone. Okay, so a lot of what we're looking at here is, um, you know, with our previous studies, you know, we did a before, with, and after. And you really need to do more longitudinal studies to get a feel for how these things work over a longer period of time. So we're working with Accenture in Chicago to try to get this into their meeting spaces and try to use this topic table for meetings of people that meet regularly every week, some remote and some local. Try to see if we can look at sort of like themes that evolve or um, you know, how idea formation happens over time, but also you know, as a way to sort of aid in the classification process. So like you mentioned earlier, you know, we don't want people to be staring at this during while it's happening. So it turns out that it's best after a meeting for people to change and like fix the clusters around. If somebody though feels very adamant or sometimes we have somebody who is really happy to not be taking minutes anymore and let the table take minutes for them, they might sit there and personally do it while everybody else speaks. But the model does, the learning model does change every time you change the word. So in a sense, you're creating your own learning model for this particular group and for this context. And you keep that model next time you meet. So again, this is the early stages. Um, but if you have any suggestions, I would be grateful. Um, finally, we're doing a lot of work um, with children um, on the um, autism spectrum. Um, we do st this, what I'm going to show you now is a bit more of the work with the lower functioning kids. What we do is we, we have some real-time visualization tools, uh, visualizations that are audio, some are audio visualization and some are um, visual visuals, visual feed, audio feedback, visual feedback. And um, for, for a while now, um, people always thought that people on the spectrum were visually oriented, that they were visual thinkers. And um, what we found in our small studies, this is not you know, concrete, but uh, we followed five students for about a year now, and three of them actually prefer audio feedback than visual feedback um, in what they do. And a lot of this is there just hasn't been that much study in this domain before. Um, but some examples of what we do are, um, this is uh, a child here, so I, I can only show one video because this is the only permission we have. But um, we have different settings. So a lot of these children also have, um, it, it's hard to keep attention on something, almost like attention deficit disorder. So you know, for one of the children, we actually had confined a space. And she preferred a much larger screen than the smaller screen. We only had one female in the study. And she was the only one that liked the really large screen. Um, one kid really liked the trampoline. And so if he was on the trampoline, he would pay attention to what was going on. But most of the kids actually preferred sitting in a chair in the small screen. Our original idea was to envision this in a big room and have the room sort of give you feedback. But they really like to focus just on the screen itself and just sit in the chair. Um, so this is just an example of one of the early, um, of one of the early studies. And if you're interested in hearing more about this work, this paper is going to be presented on Monday at Assets um, in Halifax. Um, and sort of, I, I hope that in telling the story, you got to see sort of um, how audio can be more important. My, my personal opinion is I think audio is overlooked um, in interfaces. Um, video can be so much sexier. Video can be, um, it's almost like instant gratification. But it's amazing how without audio, you really lose a lot. I mean, there's been many psychological studies that if you show somebody really bad resolution video with high quality audio, they think the video is really good. Or if you show somebody the opposite, like really good quality video with bad audio, they think it, the video is bad. And one of the things that I found in these studies, um, and it might not seem so apparent because they're all graphically based, but it's the audio that makes them work. And it's the audio that actually makes the product, that is the inspiration and motivation for the project. And I really think we should spend more time um, exploring it. Also, I think that we've gone through so many different techniques and we keep looking at the, what's new, the hottest new fat. And sometimes we can just take a few steps back and look at what we haven't tried, or even some of the simple graphical um, primitives of um, and just exploring audio in that way and just seeing how much it can give us just by seeing a history of it. 
Um, just to um, end the talk, because um, I live in Urbana, um, we've been doing some studies on the differences between social networks between people in rural areas and urban areas, and we found some very interesting results if you'd like to talk about it. Um, we're also done some work extending Granovator's work on social ties and the strength of social ties, um, in particular the strength of weak ties, and how um, we found which effects in Facebook. We, we've built a model that can predict if you're, somebody's a strong tie or a weak tie for you. So we do several different um, types of work, and um, today's talk was just on the um, audio-related stuff, but, um, but if you're interested, there's a lot more to say. And finally, I just um, I want to, you all to know that um, it's the students that really made all of this work possible. They're amazing, and um, they make the school what it is. So um, um, this work is, um, is theirs. So thank you. Okay, um, questions? <coughs> yes? Can you look at um, maybe a, a, a when, when these um, visualizations, you know, though it might be a distraction, maybe the people actually retain a lot. If you interview about what was said no. after the meeting, no. like in an average meeting, that. then that's this. No, but that's a good direction to go into. We have a lot of people asking for the transcriptions or for keeping these visualizations. And the number one thing we get is asking to annotate it and being able to put some more documents into it so they can have not just an archive, but also of what was referenced during that archive. But talking about retention, um, we're also using the conversation clock right now with the University of Maryland to do studies um, with kids between the ages of 12 and 15 who've been diagnosed with Asperger's. And we're doing contingency analysis there because using the table, they can take turns. Like they know, we've modified it slightly to, sh to encourage them to take various size turns. Um, but contingency is key. So they will take the turn, but it'll have nothing to, the topic will have nothing to do with what um, the previous person said. So it's not just about, t in that case, it's not just about taking turns, but also maintaining the same topic and retaining it. But that's, an ad that's tangential to your question. But any other? Yes. Uh, so once you've got the design done, there's also the technology part. So how difficult is that to get through? And like, have there been cases when the design couldn't be executed because of, of technology? Yeah, yeah. That happens a lot. And what you do is, you know, when you design interfaces, you sh and some, sometimes we're lucky. So for example, with the uh, with telemurals, um, I got lucky that there was like some delay. For example, one of the biggest problems with speech um, um, with teleconferencing is is linking the mouth to the audio. So one of the things that we tried to do there is because you can't get the technology there fast enough, we specifically tried not to show the lips. So um, in that sense, by abstracting it, you mitigate the problems that you have with not perfect technology. So I think we're in an excellent position to, to look at some of these things, being designers and building interfaces and seeing there's a lot you can do with an interface to actually help or ease you know, some of the problems that you're looking at. Yes. So apart from uh, sociology research, what do you think could be the application of uh, work? Because going forward, if the bandwidth increases, yeah. transferring video or playing around with video may not be uh, such a big deal in terms of bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So I might as well put a real face if I want to do a virtual reality sort of application rather than... Yeah. True. One of the things is that if you look at video conferencing, most people actually end up turning off the faces. And like I mentioned earlier, they primarily look at agreement or disagreement um, and attention level. Um, that's, those are the two big things you see in teleconferencing. And for the rest of it, the face really isn't that important. Um, some people might prefer it, and that's fine. Um, but the thing is that with an abstract interface like this, it might even help you search more. So for example, if you look at moments of laughter or moments of argument or people speaking at the same time, that in itself is a cue. Those turned out to be sort of like the hyperlinks into the conversation where people looked at, whereas you don't get that from something like archiving all video or with a system like classroom, like the E2000 classroom, where you went through everything at 15 minute intervals. Um, what would happen if you could just like choose a moment and jump into it there and also hear it once you clicked on it like a record, actually heard what was going on at that time. Do you really need the face all the time? That's, I don't think you do. Um, we haven't studied it, but that's my theory. Another difference, this is just sort of like a tidbit because of the elections, but it turns out that um, you know, what, if you don't have perfect sync with the face and the audio, 
Um, most of the time, the audio comes before the video, and that just makes people confused. If, however, the audio comes after the video, all of a sudden you don't trust the person that's speaking. And this is in many ways sort of like media warfare that's been going on for some time. So if you, you know, go down and you download you know, some um, advertisement by a candidate, and then you look at um, where the audio is for them and look at where they put the audio for their opponent, um, more often than not, I found that they actually move the audio after the video to use some of these psychological tricks of, of not trusting. So if you're going to store faces, um, if you're going to store faces, store the audio as well. My argument is I don't think you need them. I think you can get a lot more. I mean, I was surprised what you can get with just with audio and volume. I mean, it's just by having volume and history, all of a sudden you got something that you didn't have before that you can't get with a face. And like I mentioned earlier, do we really want to mimic face-to-face -face interaction exactly? We don't need all the thousands of cues a face might give us. Um, but the challenge is finding which ones we do need. Um, any other questions? Okay, well. Thanks. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.